Good morning everyone and welcome to Ferrer's webinar about Origen, which is a new service regarding whole genome sequencing that Ferrer has launched for the food industry. My name is Barry Hilton and I'm the Business Development Manager for Food and shortly I will introduce my colleague Dr Edward Haynes who will be giving this presentation but first I just wanted to provide a few points for your information. The webinar has been put together to talk about traditional ways of identifying food pathogens and how recent changes in technology now mean that it's possible to use whole genome sequencing in this area. It will also explain reasons why you may want to use this service and how Origen can benefit the food industry. In this specific webinar, the audio function has been disabled for participants, so if you have any questions you'd like to put to us, if you can use the chat function on the right hand side of your screen, I think it's a square box, and select the presenter, then type your question, we will then answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. Contact details for myself and Edward will be available at the end of the presentation in case anyone would like any more information. Finally, We'll be recording this webinar, so please email us at the end of this if you would like a copy to be sent to you. So, without further ado, I will now hand over to Edward to begin the presentation. So, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for tuning into this webinar on the use of whole genome sequencing for food safety. I'm Ed Haynes. I'm a Food Standards Agency FERA Joint Research Fellow in Molecular Epidemiology. So, at FERA, we're interested in foodborne pathogens because they still cause a large public health burden in the UK and further abroad. Uh, in the UK, Campylobacter is the pathogen that causes the most cases, almost 300,000 cases of Campylobacterosis a year. But Salmonella is another important bacterial pathogen, uh, causing tens of thousands of cases every year. And another important pathogen is Listeria monocytogenes. And while this causes far fewer cases, uh, the case fatality rate is very high, especially among certain at-risk groups, such as pregnant women or immunocompromised individuals. We're going to be focusing in this talk on bacterial pathogens because some of the techniques we're interested in are most well advanced for this group of organisms. As well as the public health burden of foodborne disease, there's also additional concerns for the food industry, including brand or reputation protection, risk of litigation, and so on. So if we can use some of this new technology to really combat foodborne disease, um, we can help public health, but also help the food industry as well. So it's a win-win. The reason that we're in spread, either within a country or within a food manufacturing facility. So there are a number of different type volume, subtype, um, different bacterial species, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, moldy TOF is a proteomics based approach which is very rapid for identifying bacterial species but starts to struggle when you try and identify strains within a species. Serotyping is a widely used um, method based on the presence of different surface antigens for some species. Salmonella is a, is a pathogen that is frequently serotyped and there are many different serotypes of Salmonella. However, in the UK, approximately 50% of clinical cases of salmonellosis are caused by one of two different serovars. So if you identify one of those serovars, it doesn't really give you much additional information about where your case might have come from. Uh, MLST, or multi locus sequence typing, is a more discriminatory approach. It enables you to look for finer level differences between different strains. Uh, it's an approach based on DNA sequencing a number of different genes on the bacterial chromosome, normally around seven genes. And then with this DNA information, you can start to work out how closely related isolates are and where uh, cases might have come from. Uh, however, you do still suffer from the problem of different sequence types being particularly common and therefore give you limited extra information. And then finally is uh, PFGE, or pulsed field gel electrophoresis. This was uh, previously thought of as a kind of gold standard for differentiating strains uh, of foodborne pathogens. It is highly discriminatory, but it's, uh, it's very labor intensive as well and requires a lot of different specialist skills. Um, it's, it's a pattern based on matching different band, it's a, sorry, it's a, a program based on banding pattern matching of different DNA fragments on a gel. So it can be quite subjective. Um, if you're trying to work out whether a fragment is, is one fragment or two very similar fragments. Uh, and it's also not capable of distinguishing between extremely closely related strains. 
So all of these different methods have their advantages, but they also have different disadvantages. In comparison, whole genome sequencing, or WGS, is conceptually straightforward. So what we do is we take two bacterial culture, extract the DNA from that, and then sequence it on one of the number of next generation sequencing platforms. And then we interpret these uh, DNA sequences automatically. The reason we want to look at the whole genome is that instead of looking at a fragment or a subset of variation, as you did in all of the previous um, techniques, here you're looking at every base or virtually every base in the bacterial genome. And there's many more uh, potential regions of variety. It gives you lots of different um, abilities to, uh, to really drill down and get really fine level differences between strains. So it's much more able to discriminate between very closely related um, strains than previous techniques. So as I mentioned, this ability to do um, whole genome sequencing uh, more easily has come about as a result of uh, technology advances. So Ferret has been involved in next generation sequencing since 2009 when we acquired our, our first next generation sequencer, a Roche 454 platform. This was really a step change in our ability to perform um, whole genome sequencing of microorganisms. Um, but now uh, the technology is moving so fast that it's no longer supported by Roche, it's uh, become outdated. And we've moved the vast majority of our sequencing onto a platform called the Aluminum MySeq. This is probably the most widely used next generation sequencing platform in the world. It's capable of producing large amounts of extremely accurate uh, data, um, relatively problem free. And it's perfect for bacterial whole genome sequencing applications. However, at Ferro, we're also interested in more experimental sequencing approaches. So we're working on, for example, the Oxford Nanopore MinIron platform, which is a much smaller, uh, more portable platform, which really aims to take next generation sequencing and whole genome sequencing out of the lab and into the field. So once you've generated all of your millions of base pairs of DNA sequence from a bacterial whole genome, you then have to analyze it. And the way you do that really depends on what kind of questions you want answered. So, for example, you might want to compare your genome to a global database of um, tens of thousands of other genomes to look for what it's most closely related to. And that might give you clues as to where it's come from. And there are a number of different uh, rapid clustering algorithms that allow you to do this, but there is some degree of trade-off um, of rapidity against accuracy. Alternatively, what you might want to do is take your millions of base pairs of DNA sequence and then um, try and reconstitute or assemble uh, the bacterial chromosome sequence, and that will enable you to work out which genes are present. Or you might simply want to compare your sequence to a known reference chromosome in a process called uh, SNP calling or SNP analysis, where SNP refers to single nucleotide polymorphisms, or just single base pair differences between your sequences and the chromosome sequence. So that's a very commonly used way of working out uh, how closely related your isolate is to a known reference, or you can try and reconstitute MLST, multi locus sequence typing types, uh, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago. But instead of being constrained to the seven traditional MLST genes, you can start to expand that up to tens, hundreds, even thousands of genes, which will give you a much more accurate picture as to how closely related your sample is to other samples. The other tremendous thing about whole genome sequencing is that you get all or virtually all of the genes in a genome. And with that information, you can start to work out which um, genes might have a phenotypic effect in the organism of interest. Uh, these could include virulence factors, so how capable is your organism of causing disease, or it might be whether there are antimicrobial resistance genes present, um, or potentially whether there are antibiocide genes present in your um, organism, which might give clues as to what potential uh, treatment or hygiene regimes might be effective. So this is more in the future. At the moment, what we're primarily interested in is, is using whole genome sequencing for differentiating between different strains of a pathogen. So the technology is there. There's a lot of analysis uh, software available. And now the regulators are really starting to recognize the power of WGS. So uh, the Food Standards Agency published a report earlier this year um, about the use of WGS for food safety. There, they recognize that it provides uh, kind of the ultimate level of discrimination between strains. 
Um, the data that you get in terms of DNA sequence is highly portable, so very easily shared amongst labs over the internet. And technologically, the cost per base of sequencing has really uh, come down over the last 10 years dramatically. So the FSA realizes that WGS is probably the future of um, food safety, food molecular epidemiology, um, and is really encouraging the food industry to, to become involved in these sorts of efforts. In the US, um, they're extremely far advanced with this sort of work. Um, the US Food and Drug Administration has been running their genome tracker program since 2013. Um, this is a program of uh, labs across the US that sequence um, foodborne um, bacterial pathogens and then upload uh, the data to the FDA central, um, uh, central lab. And so far to date, they've sequenced more than 50,000 isolates of um, bacterial pathogens. These are primarily Salmonella, but also Listeria, uh, E. coli, and to a lesser extent, Campylobacter as well. In the UK, Public Health England has also sequenced thousands of Salmonella genomes and many, many E. coli genomes as well. And the benefit from a regulatory point of view of them sharing this data is that it enables people around the world to access it and an understanding of how um, pathogens might be spreading globally as well. So the food regulator is really involved, but we're convinced as well that WGS has a role for the food industry um, to help them. So at a recent conference, the Global Microbial Identifier Conference in Rome, I was made aware of a case study of a, an industrial organization, a large multinational food manufacturer, which had a salmonella contamination event at one of their factories. Um, salmonella was detected across nine locations around different zones of the factory, and through conventional serotyping, identified as two different serovars. However, when these isolates were subjected to WGS analysis, it was found that there were three or four That's incredibly small amount of variety. And there was also more than 50 different um, single nucleotide differences between that and anything that's been seen previously. So this is extremely conclusive evidence that um, these factory isolates had a common origin. There was only one introduction of salmonella into this factory. And then when this was combined with metadata about where in the factory uh, they were found and when, um, this enabled inferences to be drawn about exactly how contamination was spreading throughout this factory. So as I say, at Ferro, we're definitely convinced that, uh, that WGS has a role to play for the food industry. There are all sorts of different applications you can think of for WGS. So one really interesting uh, example, I think, is looking at trends over time. So you, this would be a great technique for looking at whether you have a, a resident strain of listeria, for example, in your factory that is assisting through uh, decontamination events, indicating a, a problem with hygiene methods, or whether you have successful eradication of a type and then reintroduction of new types, which might indicate a failure of biocontrol in your facility. WGS is so accurate that it has the potential to implicate individual pieces of equipment. So you might find um, a, a piece of equipment that is harboring diversity and then disseminating it out to the rest of the factory. And that piece of equipment can then be deep cleaned or even replaced. And then if you have access to isolates from foodstuffs, you can start to make links to external sources of contamination. So looking for how exactly um, this, uh, this pathogen got into the factory in the first place. So based on the, the technology, Ferro's expertise in WGS, the fact that um, the food regulators and the food industry are starting to recognize the power of it, Ferro has launched a new service for the food industry called Origin. This is a WGS-based traceback service um, to help the food industry understand contamination within their facilities. Um, we're very flexible at the moment about how it might work. So one way that we might be able to, uh, or that we might choose to do this is to send out uh, sampling packs to a company. They can take environmental swabs from around their factory, send them back to us. We'll culture um, the passion of interest, DNA extract it, sequence it, and then analyze it. And then based on uh, the relatedness of these isolates and where in a factory they've come from, we can make inferences and have conversations with the customer about how exactly this contamination might be occurring. Alternatively, um, Origin is capable of plugging into an existing environmental monitoring regime. So a food industry uh, customer might have a contract lab who is already uh, performing environmental sampling 
and collecting isolates. Those isolates, instead of being binned, can now be repurposed to, um, into the origin pipeline to get added value from existing environmental monitoring regimes. And this would be really useful in terms of long-term um, understanding of how types are, are persisting or otherwise. In terms of what the service costs, we're, we're currently working on a kind of case-by-case -case basis purely because there's, there's so much variety in the different factors that might have an impact um, in terms of batch size, um, how long a customer will be prepared to wait, whether we're receiving swabs, whether we're receiving isolates. Um, so the full end-to-end -end service on 45 samples is approximately £200 a sample. But as I say, there are many factors that um, can affect that, so I'd be um, very happy to talk about that further with anybody. So we definitely see many advantages to uh, the origin service. We think that um, it is a way of putting you back in control. It can highlight uh, potential weaknesses in quality control, and the cost will be offset by protecting the company from potential brand damage, uh, maintaining public trust, and reducing the risk of a costly recall. So at the moment, we've just launched this service. We've had a lot of interest already. And what we're really keen to do at the moment is to have the need from Origen in order to be able to, to use it or to justify it, and really um, how we can help the food industry make the most of this really powerful new technology. So um, thank you very much for listening to that. Um, Barry and I would be very happy to take any questions you have now through the chat box, or um, if you'd rather talk uh, in person, you can drop me an email or give me a phone call. I'd be very happy to talk to you about any aspect of this. Uh, thank you very much.